when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And, and we can emphasize the word when there. Um, because this, again, keep in mind that these parables are, are related, obviously, to the uh, Mount Olivet prophecy in chapter 24. Uh, when the disciples ask concerning what shall be the sign of thy coming, right? Uh, and so after he uh, explains the, uh, the events which uh, will be in their times and the, the destruction of, of the temple when one not, not one stone will be left upon another, and then he goes into uh, the, the parable of the fig tree, and that gives, gives some t a timing reference to his coming. Uh, but his focus as we stated before, being primarily on, on the, the sake of his brethren. He provided these four parables, one of them in chapter 24 and these three here in chapter 25, which relate directly to what is the sign of thy coming, or at least the, the, the idea of his establishing of uh, the kingdom of God when, when he would sit upon the throne of David, right? That's what they were looking for in Acts chapter 1. As he was leaving, they said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So this is what they were looking for. And the idea of a span of time between uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the establishing of his throne was something that was not familiar to them. But it is a fact. It is a fact that he has been gone for nearly 2,000 years. And so he addresses his uh, followers through these four parables about how they are to live in his absence because he is coming back and there will be a reckoning. And that's what we see here in, in this very first verse. So we're actually dividing verse one into two. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Again, emphasis of when and uh, tied to the idea of what shall be the sign of thy coming. Um, and then the second part of the verse, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And Christianity actually uh, disputes this statement. Okay, they have a totally different view, um, regardless of what the Lord has said here in this, in this parable. All right, so gathered all nations. What, does, what is meant by the phrase all nations there? We, we need to determine that. The sheep and the goats, that's really the, uh, the, the center, right? The, the, the main point of the, um, of the parable. Uh, so why did he pick sheep and goats? What is it about sheep and goats? Um, and then his right hand. Why is this the good side? Why do the, the sheep, why do the acceptable go to his right hand and the unacceptable go to the left? Um, the next thing we're going to look at is the idea of the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So that how, the, the idea behind this is how has the kingdom been in preparation all this time? Right? And why is it for the righteous? Why, why has it been prepared in this particular manner for the sake of the righteous? And then the next one there, the royal commandment. And of course, you're not going to see those words in... Uh, in the parable in the Lord's words here, but this is actually verses 35 uh, and 36. This is the royal commandment, okay? And then finally, we'll finish up with the least of these, my brother. Why the least? Why does he say, you've done it unto me if you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren? That's rather specific. He doesn't say, if you've done it unto my brethren, you've done it unto me. One of the least of these, okay, and that's that's what we want to we want to focus on that a little bit. So you can you can probably see where I had difficulty uh, wrapping this all up in a, a short class. So the first thing we want to look at then, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory. So the word when there, well, that conveys the idea of a predetermined event within an unspecified time frame, okay? Because if it was a specified time frame, we would say on Thursday, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, mow the lawn, whatever. But if we say, when I mow my lawn, well, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's something that's gonna happen, but we're not stating when, okay? But, and again, it, this might seem like a minor point, you know, because we, we do understand the concept of when the Son of Man shall come. Um, but the world considers it more on the basis of if. 
if at all. You know, and, 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 and definitely not in the terms that, uh, that scripture provides. So for the world, the, uh, the return of the Lord, his coming in glory is not a when, but for us it should be. And this is how he starts the parable. This is the first foundation stone of this parable. He's essentially saying, I am going to come back. And when I do, these are the things that, that will, I will accomplish. All right. And again, that's, that's just, it's been the same through all of the parables is the idea of someone going away and then coming get back again. But for us, the word when there um, indicates a, a, a sense of certainty it's going to happen okay i don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this i want to move along when the son of man shall come in his glory now the the, the um strong's has for that word come there and in, in verse 31 um to come from to come to one place from another all right, and so it's, the idea is you make your parents, you, you know, you, you come through the door, you, you've come from outside, you've come from a different town, and now you're here. That's that word. And if you remember in, in uh, our consideration of the uh, Mount Olivet prophecy, the word that the disciples used was parousia. This is not parousia. So when they said, what is, what is the sign of thy coming? They didn't expect him to be away and then to come. They expected him to reveal himself as the king sitting, sitting upon David's throne. That's the idea of parousia. But here the word is to come from another place. And so again, Jesus is addressing this very same idea. He says, I'm, I'm going to go away, but when I come back, okay. It's the same idea as in Luke chapter 19. We're not going to look it up, but Luke chapter 19, the parable of the nobleman who goes into a far country to receive a kingdom and then to come and then he comes back again, right? We're familiar with that parable. We probably did it in our classes a year ago or two or whoever knows how long. All right. And the same word is used by the angel, again, referencing that idea that I already brought up in Acts chapter 1. The angel says, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And we understand that point. We actually use that point, don't we, to, uh, to teach the physical, personal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He went away from them personally, physically, bodily, and he's going to come back in the same manner. That we, that's how we understand the words of the angel there. It's, it's the very same word. So when the Son of Man shall, shall come in his glory. And again, it might seem like a ma minor point, but it's basic to our understanding that the Lord is going to return. But it's not to many in the world who consider themselves to be Christians. They don't, they don't hold this very same idea. Their idea of, of him coming in glory is, is very much different. Um, so obviously, you know, we could spend a lot of time researching what different churches teach about his coming. It's, it's really not germane to this class. That's not the point of why we're here. Um, all right, so he comes in his glory. The, word, the Greek word is doxa. Um, the primary meaning is opinion. Okay. My doxa is what I think. Someone, but you could use the same word. He has a doxa of me, right? <laughs> what others think of me. It, it, it means opinion. That's, that is the basic understanding of the word um, glory there. And at first we might say, well, that seems kind of odd. But when we look at it, it, it's really more along the lines of, of, your, of a person's reputation. The way it's used in scripture, it's not used of my opinion of you or my opinion of this or that, because that really doesn't hold a lot of water, but it, it means a reputation. So does the Lord have a reputation? Absolutely he does, okay? Yes. It's always glory, but it can be used either as a, a, 
reputation, like I just said, or the way that Josephus and Philo use the word, <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet, also in the sense of honor, splendor, or divine radiance. And now that was some we might think, oh, that makes more sense, you know. When Christ comes, there's going to, you know, the, the world is going to honor him, all well, eventually. But there is, there is an aspect of his coming that is related to his reputation, what others think of him. Okay? And we'll, 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 we're not going to spend a lot of time going down this um, road, but consider how, how the word is used. In um, Luke chapter 14, verse 10, this is a parable that we did not too long ago. When thou art bidden, go and sit in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee comes, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. And at first this might seem to be very unchristlike. Why would we want others at that meal to worship us? Well, that's really what he means. It's the same word, doxa. It's the same word. It would be the same word as glory in the other context. And, and the idea is that by the host invitation, this person's estimation in the eyes of others is raised. Oh, he's sitting at the, at the host's table, right? So it isn't, it isn't honor and radiance the way that we might think of it, but the estimation of others that they have for that person. That's sort of like the idea of reputation. But it also is used to... Um, that word is used to relate the idea of splendor, the way that the Lord uses it in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 29. I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Okay, obviously speaking of the lilies of the field, right? And he, say, he compares their beauty to Solomon in all his splendor, all his radiance. And the the the, the uh, lilies of the field, as they were designed by the hand of the Creator, surpass the glory and splendor of of Solomon. So we get that idea too, and we don't want to say it's well, it's one or the other. Right? But we need to understand the full idea of the words as the, as they're being used. Also, Paul speaks in First Corinthians chapter fifteen talking about the, the varying magnificence of the celestials. He says, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in its glory. And those, those are all the same word. Everywhere you see that word highlighted glory, that's doxa. Okay, and what is he talking about? What, what does he say? There's a, there's a glory of the celestial and a glory of the terrestrial. What does that mean? If we've, re we've read these words before, right? They're not foreign to us. We're familiar. What's he, what's he talking about? Well, there's a, there's a varying magnificence, if you will. But it's not just like, oh, this one's brighter than this. You know, the, the, the star is brighter than the earth, so it's glorious. No, that's not what he's talking about. Paul is talking about, he's relating the idea of the natural and the spiritual. Okay, that's why he's, he's talking about varying glory, if you will, or splendor. And the spiritual is greater than the natural. Just as the star, the sun is, is, has a, a different radiance, a different glory than the than this earth does. And stars, right? Some stars are brighter than others, and they make up the constellations. And that's like, ooh, you know. And in fact, when you look at them, and the way that science has been able to open our eyes to them, they are magnificent. That's we, what we see is we see the 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 splendor of God. And but what does what? Why do we care? You know, why does God care that the one star is greater than another, or the sun is greater than the moon, and the moon is greater? Well, it speaks to his honor because he created these things that way. Okay? He gave the honor to the sun that the, that the moon doesn't have. What honor does the sun have that the moon doesn't have? Well, the moon simply reflects the light of the sun, right? So the, the sun generates that light. The moon reflects it. Now, the moon, it has that honor. It lights up the, the darkness of night 
but it is not the sun. And we know from scientific study that the sun, while that's not really a great big star, there are other stars that are, are much, much greater. Uh, but these things are, these are by the hand of the creator. He didn't create them all the same. He gave them different purpose. Okay? So the honor, the splendor of one varies from the other in the mind and the purpose of the creator. And we sit back and we look at it and we appreciate it and we praise him for it. For his wisdom. Okay. So in the case of the Lord's coming back in um, Matthew 25, both ideas are applicable to his coming, both reputation and honor. Now, the Lord's reputation um, may not be valued by this society in, in which we live right now, certainly. Um, but when the world is educated in the things of the spirit, it will come to appreciate the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm talking about reputation, okay? It's the manner in which he is known. He has a certain reputation. We all have reputation amongst our circles and in various circles in which we uh, move about. Well, he has one too. He has one too, because he is sinless. He is just, he is faithful, he is obedient, he is competent, he is compassionate, he's selfless, he's without hypocrisy or guile. Now that list is long, certainly, and it's, it's absolutely without equal in man's existence, but that is his reputation. That is how we know, we view him in that way. So what bearing does that have on his return? And I'm spending way too much time on this, but I think that, I think maybe we're generating some ideas here. What does that have to do on his return? Well. His position as king is based upon all of these things. His father estimates his, the Lord's reputation in this way. And because of that, he is king. So when he comes, he's not just somebody picked out of a, out of a crowd. Oh, well, you will do. He is specifically made by the father for this position. And when he comes, he is witnessing to the Father's righteous wisdom. Does that make sense? So that reputation now is known amongst his brethren, not known to the world at large. But when he comes, it will be revealed to the world and they will honor the Father because of it. All right. Also, um, he obviously has honor above all others um, because he submitted himself to the will of his father more than any other man or woman. He has been exalted above all others. And that, that really is a, uh, uh, an important principle for us to understand because it has to do with the idea of the servant is the greatest. If you want to be the greatest, be the servant, because the servant is the greatest, because he is the most humble. There's no one who humbled themselves or submitted themselves to a greater degree than Christ. And because that, God has exalted him. And that's what Paul wrote to the Philippians, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, or because of this, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory, doxa, of God the Father. So Christ's submission to his Father, because he submitted, thy will be done, right? God has exalted him, above everyone else. And when 
he comes and that that glory is revealed, that honor is given to him when every knee shall bow to him, this will be to the glory of the Father, the doxa of the Father. So when he, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, it's a predetermined event, it will happen in an unspecified time, it is not given to you to know the, the day nor the hour, okay? when he shall come, when he shall appear in his glory. Again, both aspects of that word, doxa, is fitting. All right, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. Um, and again, a, a, a scriptural point is being made here. Okay, because Christ says, he says, when the Son of Man shall come, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. What do we understand that to mean? Do we understand this to mean that he is now sitting on his thro the throne of his glory? Or does it mean when he comes, then he shall sit? Of course, it, it makes perfect sense. But what is the throne of his glory? What is, what is he referring to? Well, you can see, I put the, uh, the, the promise, the covenant made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, right? And it, as it was repeated uh, by the angel Gabriel to uh, Mary specifically, about the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That is the throne of his glory, that which was promised to him by the Father. Now, we understand that within that, there's more than just Christ sitting on a throne. Because what we see is when Christ is on the throne, it is the vindication of the Father's words. It's the fulfilling of the promise that the Father made to David. It is a, a manifestation, if you will, of the righteousness of God when Christ sits on that throne, the throne of David. Is he sitting in a throne now? Yeah, absolutely. How do we know that? How do we know that Christ is sitting on a throne right now? Remember the promise made to the Laodicean Ecclesia in Revelation chapter 3? To him that overcometh will sit with me in my throne as I am set down on my Father's throne. As I have overcome and am set down on my Father's throne. He's sitting at the right hand of God right now. This side. Your left. My right. Okay. So he is sitting on a throne right now. But that isn't the throne of glory that he was talking about in, in Matthew chapter 25 because of the word then. Now see, the world, world's Christianity ignores that. And they say, no, 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 no. He's sitting on David's throne right now. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't put it on the, uh, on the overhead, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, Main Street, Main Street? Mainstream Christianity holds the position again that David is now sitting on, I'm sorry, Christ is now sitting on David's throne in heaven. Um, and it's based on a number of errors and, and largely a misunderstanding of the apocalypse. Um, but their, their most basic um, point of contention is that the throne of David that's mentioned in scripture is identical to the throne of God in heaven. That's the point that they try to establish. And this is how they put it. This is how they, they present that reason. They say, originally, Israel, God was Israel's king. Yes, yeah, so we, we understand that, we accept that, absolutely true. And he reigned on his throne in heaven. But Israel asked for a, a king on earth, which was apostasy, and angered God so much that he wiped out their crops. Now, I couldn't find anything in scripture where it says, we remember when, when Samuel, the, the people said, your, your sons are corrupt, we want a king. And, and, uh, and God says, don't, you know, they've rejected me from being king over them. And I couldn't find anything in there where he destroyed the crops. So and maybe I'm missing it. I don't know. It just, anyway. Okay. So Israel asked for a king on earth. The apostles angered God. He wiped out their crops. It is clear that God realized that he was being rejected. And in a symbolic way, God allowed his throne to come down to earth and have men sit and rule in his place. Okay, so in their estimation, David's throne was God's throne from heaven. Do we disagree with that? 
In a way, we do, but in another way, we don't. And we'll see from the words of Brother Roberts. Okay, and then they, they go on to quote Hosea 11, I'm sorry, 13, verse 11. I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. And then they further characterize that idea by saying the entire concept of an earthly throne is an apostasy that angered God from the time of the first king Saul to the last king before the Babylonian captivity. Now, I think you can see in this then, or we should be able to see in this, a refuting of the idea of the millennial kingdom that is taught in scriptures. Because that teaching involves a throne on earth in Jerusalem, as we shall see. But they're saying that a throne on earth is an apostasy and, an, and angers God. Okay? All right. Um, they go on, they go so far as to say, we are not waiting for Jesus to enter into his messianic reign. He enjoys it now. All of his enemies are being put under his feet as his gospel is preached and his kingdom expands. So they take the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and they apply it to the preaching of the gospel. I think we could have a problem with that because I don't think we see the gospel conquering sin in this world, do we? So all his enemies are not being put under his feet. And we understand the context in which Paul is talking in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But this is the way they apply that. So the, David's throne is identical to God's throne. He just simply moved it to earth and allowed men to sit on it. He wasn't happy about it. And eventually he took it away. He, he uh, brought that, that when he took it away from Zedekiah, his throne went back into heaven, and that's where Jesus is now sitting on that throne. That's, that's the idea that they give, okay? And the, um, this view of Christ inheriting the throne of his father David in heaven, um, this is completely divorced from the hope of Israel. It's divorced from the promises that were made to Abraham and David. And... This view is, is really an unmistakable element of replacement theology. Do we all know what replacement theology is? Okay, replacement theology, Josh, you down in a second because you heard me talk about it too many times. But replacement theology is where uh, because the Jews are instrumental in the death of Christ, God cast off the Jews and made the church on the day of Pentecost the new Israel. Israel has been replaced. And what he did was he spiritualized the promises that were made to Abraham and David. That's what replacement theology is. So when they say that Christ is sitting on David's throne in heaven, they have divorced this whole idea of Israel and the promises made to Abraham and David. And that is replacement theology. And that is, replacement theology uh, is, is one aspect of anti-Semitism um, in the Christian world. Yeah. Okay, this is what I was saying. Um, in, in, you know, we, we reject the idea that God's throne came down to heaven and David was sitting on God's throne in, in a certain sense. But in another sense, we agree with it. Because look at the words of Brother uh, Roberts. Had David a throne? He had. In what did it consist? Not the material structure which he occupied as a seat in dispensing justice. That has long ago crumbled into dust. The throne of a kingdom is not the literal seat occupied by royalty on state occasions. When we speak of the throne of England, we mean the office of position and of the monarch in this country. And that's exactly the terms in which we understand God's throne on earth, if you will. Okay, It's not his throne. It's that he changed the administration of the laws through a monarchy. Right? So he allowed them Saul, and then he gave them David and the line of David. But that king was ruling God's people as, not as God on his throne, but as God's representative to the people. In a similar fashion that the priesthood functioned. I'm surprised I don't have that in my, my references here. Because that was a major point. But it is gone. Okay. Um, but that, again, that is um, 
an essential element of our understanding. And God was very jealous of his authority in the way it was administered on earth. He held men accountable for the way that they ruled his people. Now think about David. We'll just use David as an example because he was a man after God's own heart. He was really the first king that God established. He gave them Saul. He, he allowed Saul. I would say he allowed Saul, but he established David. He allowed Saul because Saul was the kind of king that the people were looking for. But he gave them David and established David's line. And prophetically, that's important, isn't it? Because what do we read in Genesis chapter 49? That the kings come through Judah. What tribe was Saul from? Benjamin, right, very good. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was not of the line of Judah. He was not of the line of the kings that God had prophesied through Jacob in, in Genesis chapter 49. David was. David was a man after God's honor. Was David perfect? No. Do you remember, well, I'm sure you do remember, but remember when he sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. Do you remember this, the child that died? Why did the child die? Because David, through his actions, gave great occasion of the enemies of God to blaspheme. How? Wh what? What does that mean? How did David's actions give? Because he was God's representative on that throne. And the people would look at it and say, well, this is the way that God rules his people? And so that child died. Though David prayed long and hard. So God was holding him accountable for the way in which he administered God's authority represented as sitting on that throne in Jerusalem. What, how long do we have, Ralph? Excellent. Okay, so now let's go. So I, I just wanted to bring that out. Um, it is an important aspect of our understanding of the kings, on, the kings of uh, Israel and Judah sitting upon the throne, of, specifically of Judah. Israel at the beginning and then Judah after the split. I don't know that we could apply this idea to the kings of Israel at all. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I, I just don't see it. Um, well, although he did hold them accountable. All right, so let's get back to the idea again that uh, this view of uh, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and the, the, the modern Christian view that he is now sitting upon the throne of his glory as a refuting of the promises made to Abraham and David, again, the idea of replacement theology. Let's look and let's see how we can refute that with a few geographical references out of Scripture. So Psalm 2, verse 6. So this is an answer to the, the uh, rebellion of the kings of the earth because of Christ's reign. And God says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now the word set there is very interesting. It really means anoint. I have anointed my king on the holy hill of Zion. So, obviously the idea of anointing um, is of separating an individual for God's use. So, the king was anointed, uh, the priest was anointed, the prophets were anointed. Uh, setting them aside uh, for God's use, the idea of holy, right, or separate, sanctified. And it says, this is what he says, that I have anointed my king upon mine holy hill of Zion. Um, and, and the idea is familiar to us because uh, you remember when Samuel went and, and to the household of Jesse and went through all the sons and eventually he anointed David, right? But David wasn't king right then. He didn't, you know, Saul wasn't kicked out and then David sat on the throne. But David was set for it. David was chosen for it. He was set aside by God for that purpose. And through the purpose and, and will of God, it came to pass when after Saul and Jonathan were dead, David asc uh, uh, ascended to the throne. So... The idea of the anointing is a public declaration of the king. Remember the, um, the issue at the end of David's life when Adonijah was rushing to become king? 
And when David heard from it through Bathsheba, because he had promised that Solomon, her son, would be king, right? And so David, with haste, they went and they anointed Solomon. And when Adonijah found out about it, he, you know, he, 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 had, he realized he was in trouble and he left. Um, but that, that was David's way of saying, this is my heir. This is the one who's going to sit on my throne. It's a public declaration of the king. And that's what we see here in Psalm 2, verse 6. That God is publicly declaring his choice for king on the holy hill of Zion. All right, well, does, is, that, is that holy hill of Zion symbolic? Well, we have other references. Micah 4, verse 7. So this is talking about the, uh, the restoration of the people of God. Right? This is the time of the restoration of the whole household of Israel. And the Spirit declares, I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. And this, if you have your, if you have your Bibles open to that chapter, this coincides perfectly with verses 2 and 3 which speak of Zion and Jerusalem and of the king judging many people. And the, the word judging there, shafat, it means to govern. Okay, not just a judge, but a, a king, a ruler. So, Yahweh shall reign over them in Mount Zion through the king that he has appointed, the king that he has promised, through the promises made to David, okay? And I mean, obviously there are many, many uh, prophecies that we can look at that speak about Christ's reign. We know that it, we know that these words apply to Christ, but what we're trying to pick out here is the word Zion and Jerusalem. Okay, the next one, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 23, the moon shall be confounded, the earth is shamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Okay, now the, the moon and the sun there are not referencing the natural orbs in the sky, but rather the, the political and religious uh, institutions and organizations of this world will be confounded. In heaven? No, here on earth. Because that's where they are. The nations are here on earth. Their organizations of, of churches and governments are here on earth. And they will be confounded when the Lord of hosts reigns in Jerusalem. And specifically in that context, the sun and moon are speaking of the, uh, the Gentile world that have, have uh, exercised tyranny over the, over the people of God. Um, okay. And of course, that will come to an end when the Lord Jesus Christ reigns in Zion, in Jerusalem, as we perfectly understand it. So to take away the Davidic uh, aspect of the throne of Christ, as it is taught in scripture, we've just basically scratched the surface of a couple of references. Well, to take that away is to deny the covenants of promise that have been made by Yahweh. Now God spoke these words to the prophet Jeremiah, reading from the RSV. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring forth for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel and of the Levitical priests, excuse me, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn cereal offerings and to make sacrifices forever. So we see then the point. Okay, it's, it's emphasized several times in the land that the, the righteous branch, the heir of the promises made to David will rule over the house of Israel. 
And this is the very thing that these Christians deny and saying that he is sitting on the throne now because they are rejecting the idea of an earthly kingdom because God is angry about earthly kingdoms. He doesn't want a throne on earth. He wants his throne in heaven. And that's where Christ sits now. And so in their reasoning, um, this what Christ is saying here in, in Matthew 25 will never come to pass. It will never happen. Not in the way that Scripture supports it. They, they make up other ways. So we'll, we'll look at that next time. But So we have to wonder then, what do Christians make of this phrase here? I guess we, we'll address it now. We got time, Ralph? Two minutes. Yes, we do. Okay. So how do they address this idea of then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory? Well, um, the most common way is, is presented... Um, in a certain fashion, I found um, MacArthur's New Testament commentary. So this is just, you know, a, a Bible scholar writing a commentary on the New Testament. And this is what, this is how it's presented in that, in his writing. It says, the subjects of Christ's judgment will be all the nations. Ethna, nations, has the basic meaning of peoples. And here refers to every person alive on earth when the Lord returns. So in Matthew chapter 25, when it says in verse, uh, was it 32? Before him shall be gathered all nations. All right, so this is what they're saying. They're, they're addressing this prophecy. The subject of Christ's judgment will be all the nations. So everyone alive in the nation, when, when, in the nations when Christ returns will be judged. Although he will have taken all believers into heaven at the rapture, during the following seven years of the tribulation, many other people will come to believe in him. During that dreadful time, multitudes of Gentiles, as well as all surviving Jews, will be brought to faith in Christ. So the concept of his coming, then, is defined within the context of the rapture and the tribulation that follows. Right? So Christ will take away the Christians. The earth will be under the hand of the uh, Antichrist for three and a half years, then under the hand of Satan himself directly for another three and a half years. And at the end of that time, Christ will return and defeat Satan. That's the idea of the rapture and the tribulation in a nutshell. So that's what they're saying is these words apply to when he comes back after the tribulation. Somehow people are going to believe in him during that time. I'm not really sure how. And these are the ones that he will judge at his coming. And of course, this idea of the rapture and the and the uh, tribulation is based upon a misunderstanding of of uh, what Paul wrote in Thessalonians and also much of the apocalypse which they take to be a literal book right okay um, and the the idea the the doctrine if you will of the of the rapture and the tribulations beyond again beyond the scope of this class is not what we're talking about but in reference to how these churches view Christ's words in Matthew 25, in, uh, in, what's the word I want? What does it mean when it's anti? Uh, in contrast, there we go, that's what I want. In contrast to clear scriptural teaching, they make up something that fits their end time. Well, why do you need a rapture and a tribulation. Why, do, why does Christianity need that? Well, because they believe that Christ is ruling in heaven right now. And he's going to take all the good people up to be with him there while all this bad stuff goes on. And then he's going to come back and do away with all this bad stuff. <laughs> okay. But where do the promises made to Abraham and David fit into that? They don't fit anywhere. What is the foundation of our faith in the future that God has declared in his word? It's in the covenants of promise. In each covenant, God is unveiling his purpose. 
He's showing another aspect of it. And that's where our, that's where our faith is founded, but not theirs. They believe that, they, again, Christ is reigning right now in his, on his messianic throne. And things are going to happen very, very differently than what Scripture has to say. And I think it's, it's important for us to understand where, what people think in regards to these things so that we can find the right way to answer them.